uh, Pastor Stanley Lim. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. So good to be here with you this morning, worshiping with you guys. You know, I've uh, enjoyed the worship so much. You know, I, I'm always thankful for uh, worship teams that are sensitive to the Lord because it makes the uh, job of, a, uh, of the speaker much, much easier. Sometimes you go into a service, you know, where you know you have to go up and uh, you know something is missing and uh, you have to you know grind the machine again you know so that uh, somehow another praying that the spirit will fall once more so praise the lord it's a, it's really a good thing to be uh, found in god's house this morning praise god uh, i've been praying you know ever since uh, uh, you know your pastor said yes you know that i can come and minister i've been praying you know the lord for a word and and uh, I'm a very strange creature. I sleep early and I get up early. Uh, some of you won't believe if I tell you that I sleep around 8.30 to 9 o'clock. That's, uh, that's my usual routine. Even as a very young boy, you know, in high school, uh, I sleep that early. And so when my friends in school tell me they burn midnight oil during exam period, I ask them, what is midnight oil? So oh, we, we sleep late, you know, we go way past 12. I said, oh, I've never had that experience, you know. I've never had that experience. I sleep early and I rise up early. I'm up by 2.30 to 3. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So this, this morning I was up uh, at about, about 3, right, and praying and, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not time for me. <laughs> So I, I had my yogurt at 5.30, <laughs> all right, so praise God. I mean, that's, that's, that's me, all right, because I find uh, I work mornings much better. And so when I'm in church, when I was pastoring uh, Dan, when I was in church, you know, I'm like uh, uh, doing a walkabout ministry. I'm never at my desk, all right, I'm always at this pastor's desk, that pastor's desk, you know, that... Uh, you know, uh, staff there, you know, and uh, talking to them, and said, then some of them says, Pastor, why are you so free, one? Ah? <laughs> I said, because I've done all my work, you know, early in the morning, I finish, you know, I finish, you know, when I was doing my, uh, my doctorate, you know, uh, I did my dissertation all in the mornings, because I can finish a 200-page book in about one and a half to two hours, speed reading, I've taken a training on speed reading, so that's, that's, that's this. So you work on your strengths, huh? you work on your strengths, praise God. I just want to share on a, on a, on a subject uh, which I uh, have informed you that, you know, this, that's something that God has been speaking to my heart. Because I've been traveling, you know, this past couple of years as an itinerant minister, uh, I find churches, you know, uh, struggling with transitions. Uh, and some transitions uh, work fine. But some transitions are very, very disastrous, where uh, it has split the church right in the middle, uh, and, uh, and ministers leave, you know, with anger, with unforgiveness, and, uh, and they just, just feel very, very sorry for the pastors. Some are very, very happy that the pastors are leaving, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and all kinds of experiences. And so, and I've been, you know, uh, searching. Uh, you know, the scriptures and, uh, and being a Bible school teacher too, uh, this is a subject that is close to my heart and so I've been teaching and uh, uh, inspiring, you know, future pastors, you know, to, to consider succession planning. Even when you assume a new church, you start succession planning day one. You know, you look for layers and layers of leaders to raise uh, for the kingdom. And this morning, I want to share with you on the revival of the next generation based on 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I pray that God will open your heart, open your minds, and, and that the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you. Because it is a very important passage where we can learn very important, precious lessons from the Lord. That the church can flourish, the church can thrive uh, as we learn to release the next generation for the kingdom. Somebody say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I've not got the scriptures on the slides, uh, but uh, if you can, please turn to your hard copies or your, uh, your e-Bibles and just following along. 
chapter 17, the first Samuel. I want to read from verse 1, perhaps right unto verse, um, let's see, verse uh, 7, okay? The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Sukkot in uh, Judah and Azekah at uh, Ephes Tamin. Saul counted, oh, sorry, counted by gathering the Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites face each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gat, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was, nine, he was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze uh, coat of uh, more, all right, male weight, like 125 pounds, wow. He also wore bronze lick armour and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armour-bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Let us pray. Our Father, this morning, we thank you for the worship of your saints. We thank you for your presence, dear Lord, because you have promised that you would dwell in the midst of the presence of your people, in the praises of your people. And so, Father, we claim your divine presence here, and that, Lord, you will speak to each and every heart. You will cause hungry hearts, dear Lord, to be fed. You will cause ready spirits, dear Lord, to arise and to take up your challenge this day. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will bring and subject our wandering thoughts to the obedience of Christ. That Father, O Lord, that every soul, every person, every mind that is open to you, Father, will respond with obedience to the preaching of your word. For I ask and I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. What a passage of Scripture which we are all familiar with. There's those of you that grew up in Sunday school or children's church, you know, you would have uh, uh, been familiar, you know, with this passage of Scripture, you know, of how, you know, Goliath stood before the armies of Israel and began to challenge them and, and somehow, you know, uh, uh, David, you know, heard about this, you know, and, and, and wanted to, uh, to go, you know, to... Uh, to the armies, and of course, in, as the passage goes on, we are told that in obedience to the instruction of Jesse's father, he brought bread to his brothers you know, to eat, and, and, and that's where the story uh, began, you know, that he heard the challenge of Goliath, he heard the, uh, uh, the ridicule of uh, the Israelite army, and there he was, as young as he was, you know, but full of faith, full of challenge from the Holy Spirit. He says, I will go and face this, this guy. I will go and face this warrior, you know, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so this is the, the beginning of the, of the story. And uh, I believe with all my heart that this passage contains to us the Davidic generation, all right, which is the new uh, next generation that is being released today in our church. I believe there are many, many Davids that God is preparing in the body of Christ right now. And to those of you, uh, you know, who are hearing and you fall in this category, I pray that you will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, allow the Holy Spirit to ignite your faith and cause it to be alive this morning so that you can take this church even to the next, uh, you know, decade uh, and so on. There are four keys that we need to know that the next generation has come into place. Number one, understand the landscape that you and I are operating today. All right? And first, the first one is the landscape that we are in is a landscape of compromise. First, uh, Samuel chapter 17 and verse 1. Notice in verse 1, we are told that the Philistines mustered their army for battle and camp between Sukkot, all right, in uh, Judah and Azekah at Ephesus 
that to the mean. You know, notice that the, the, the Philistine armies, you know, they were coming. They were coming and they were just, you know, like in, you know, camping there and they were uh, uh, ridiculing the, 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 the army of Israel and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And here we are told that this is a strong army. It's not an ordinary army. It is, a, uh, it is an enemy that is full of intimidation, that is an enemy that wants to instill fear. And fear is a, is a very powerful weapon that the devil has used very, very successfully, especially uh, to Christians. Because fear paralyzes Christians. Fear causes you to lose your faith. Fear and faith does not coexist. If there is fear, there is no faith. If there is faith, there is no fear. And so we must know the, uh, uh, the, the, the weapon of the enemy. When the enemy strikes you with fear, he, he is wanting to remove all source of faith from you. Faith is important for us because faith is the element of growth. Faith is the element where we can see God. Amen? Hebrews 11 verse 6. We must believe that God exists and that He is a God that would reward those that diligently seek Him. When you have a growing faith, you will have minimal fear in your life. When your faith is growing, when your faith is vibrant, when your faith is based on what God says in His Word, there will be no place for fear to reside. And the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of the Lord. All right? So faith is important. Now, I appreciate Christian books. I read Christian books. I read uh, biographical uh, books of great men of God and so on and so forth. But I have this to say to you. Christian books, good Christian books, don't grow your faith. They inspire your faith. All right? They inspire you. But it is only God's Word that grows your faith. Amen? Amen. It is only God's Word that gives you a picture of who God is and how big is the God that you and I serve today. Hallelujah. And so, get into the Word. Get into the Word day and night. Alright? I like your baby dedication. Because Deuteronomy 6 talks about, you know, how, the role of a father. What we are supposed to do. Many of us relegate the, our roles as fathers to our wives, to the mothers. All right? Giving the excuse that, you know, I've got to earn a living, I've got to get bread on the table, you know, to feed the family. And so we, we, we relegate the roles of, of, of what Deuteronomy 6 tells us, impressing upon our children. From the moment they wake up, impress them with God's word, instruct them. Tell them about your story of faith, how you met with God, how God changed your life. Instill in them the love of God. I'm so grateful to the Lord that all three of my children, you know, were personally led to the Lord uh, by my wife. And uh, there was one time I was in, Bi in, in, in Bible study in, in, uh, in church, you know, and, and my wife was so... Uh, excited to, to, you know, let me know that, you know, our youngest boy has accepted Christ uh, while at home. And so, immediately, you know, he knows when is my Bible study over. And so, he called me, you know, on the phone and says, you know, Stan, I want to let you know. It's an exciting news. I said, what's that? I said, John has accepted Christ. I said, wow, praise God. Each and every one of them were personally led to the Lord. And I pray that you will have the experience, all right, of leading your own children. Don't leave the job to the church. What can the church do in one and a half hours to your kids? Your kids spend more time with you from Monday to Saturday. The church can do, can turn them into superman, superwoman. <laughs> no, it's just a supplementary thing, you know, that the church is doing. But what you do from Monday to Saturday is important. And so here we are, the armies of, of the Philistines intimidating, you know, and, and, and challenging, you know, and, and ridiculing them and saying all kinds of things, you know, uh, to, to the Israelites. Likewise, 
In the same manner, when you believe in Jesus, people just call you all kinds of names, Holy Joe and, and stuff like that. But do, not, do not be intimidated by your faith, by your belief in, in Jesus Christ and what your friends say about you. It is also a landscape. The landscape that we're living in is a landscape of obligatory commitment. Notice in verse 8 and, uh, and verse uh, 16, all right? In verse 8 and verse 16, here, <clears throat> let's look at this. Goliath stood and shouted a tout across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. All right, choose one man to come down and fight me. Come down here and fight me. Now notice, you know, you know, he is just, he's just shouting. He's, just, he's got a very loud voice, you know. He's just shouting. But let me tell you this, that even though Goliath was found in this posture of challenging the Israelites to send someone to fight him, but deep within him, actually, he is also fearing. Now, you don't read that, is it true? You don't read that. Because the armies were there, you know, he don't have to shout. He can just go in and rout them. Is it true? He just says, go in and just, and just uh, slaughter each one of them. Why is he calling out, send one man? You know, so there's an element of fear that Goliath had as well, you know. So here he was, right? And in, in, in verse, uh, uh, what is that? 16, right? In verse 16. Let's look at verse 16 here. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strouted in front of the Israelite army. Can you imagine? Every day, he's coming out. Da, 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 da. For 40 days, he's doing that. 40 days! More than a month! You know, it's like your, your friend telling you, hey, you, you know, you're a Christian, what for? La? Your God is hopeless. La. Okay, next day, he comes again and, and he tells you the same thing. For 40 days, he's doing that. Yeah? He's doing that. Intimidation. Intimidation. Never allow the enemy to intimidate you. Yeah? And thirdly, we are living in a landscape of chilling Goliaths. Friends, in these days, in these challenging days, there are many, many Goliaths that we are facing right now. Especially in this post pandemic era. You know, in every church that I go to, I warn the churches that I preach. Now is the time, this post-pandemic area, now is the time for us not to play church anymore. Not to play church anymore. We are to live in serious commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when I was a young boy, I used to have a notebook and I used to record the number of earthquakes that the world was experiencing, you know. But as I began to grow, as I began to pastor, I noticed that, you know, my notebook was running out of pages very fast. Until now, I'm totally given up. Because right now, as I'm speaking, there are at least more than 20 earthquakes that are going on around the world. Some big ones, some small ones, you know. In the Philippines alone, in one week, there are at least five to six earthquakes that are happening. It is, what we read in the news are the big ones, but the small tremors are not reported to us in the news for us. We are living in a landscape of chilling Goliaths. Bad news overwhelm good news. Is it true? The economy, all right? Your governments have changed. Our governments have changed, you know, and it's, it's record. <laughs> we have a prime minister, three prime ministers in a short period of time. Friends, we must understand that the landscapes that you and I are operating right now, these are the landscapes. But will we be defeated by the landscapes? No. We will not be defeated. Number two, we need to see the Davids arising from within us. 
among us. Ezekiel 22, 22 and verse 30, you know, we are told, you know, this particular passage is basically, you know, used much by the intercessors. You know, God is looking for a man that will stand in the gap. We use that a lot, you know, to challenge people to rise up, to take up, you know, their positions of prayer and intercession, you know, for churches, for individuals, for missionaries, for those that are uh, battling in the forefront. But I want to say this to you, that God is challenging the church for the Davids to rise up within us. You know, we had uh, recently a, 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 a seminar, you know, uh, held for the uh, Assemblies of God. I, I, I'm a credential member of the Assemblies of God of Malaysia. And um, succession planning is a very needful uh, uh, situation here for the, the AOG in Malaysia because most of us, you know, uh, that, uh, that pioneered new churches in the 70s and 80s, we're all in our grey ages. We're all grey and, and, and uh, we don't seem to raise up, you know, successes for our, uh, for our churches and for our, for our ministries. And so we organised a seminar, you know, for, uh, to educate our pastors, you know, talking about raising up the next uh, generation. And the, uh, the, the person, the, 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 the speaker that came and challenges, he says, your successes are actually found in your Sunday schools. The budgets that we allocate for our ministries in our churches will reveal the importance of that particular ministry. Watch your budgets. If you have a lot you know, a huge sum, a huge percentage, you know, for a certain ministry, and then you relegate only the remainders, the leftovers for your training ministry, he says, that is a wrong move. Because your future successor is actually in the Sunday school, in the children's church. So investing in the future of our young people is the direction for the church. Wow. And when that was spoken, so many of our pastors suddenly begin to, you know, to, to turn to each other and begin to talk to each other and say, hey, yeah, I think we need to really relook at, at our budgeting, relook at our emphasis, you know, and, 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 and not just, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, treat the Sunday school, you know, like a, like a time, you know, to play with the kids, you know, and uh, while the adults are uh, worshipping God, you know, in, in the services. The Davidic generation is a generation of history makers. I'm now preparing, you know, to teach uh, in Singapore, in the Singapore Bible School, you know, uh, on, on leadership, pastoral leadership. And one of the areas that, that I'm researching right now is looking into the various different generations and how to interlink the different generations in such a way that there is cooperation, there is support, there is supplementary uh, uh, support and complementary support that, that we can give to each other. And I begin to, as I begin to look into some of the traits and characteristics of the, each of the generations, I begin to find that the generation... Acts are history makers. They are very daring, they are very bold, but they are very afraid of failures and they give up very easily. One of their characteristics is that they give up very easily. But they need people to come alongside to hold their hands and encourage them and say, don't give up. I'm here with you. I'll hold you. When you fall, I'll help you. I'll show you how. We need people that will stand alongside with these people. And yet they have the quality of history making in their lives. Notice that some of the of, uh, feats that they've done, the fastest Climber, you know, uh, on, on the building, you know, this, this guy by the name of Saul, you know, he was just recently crowned as the champion, you know, when he, when he uh, ran up the, uh, the Empire State Building, you know, up and down in, a, in, in, in record time. He's a young man. And his goal is just to break record. 
after record. History makers. The Davidic generation is a generation of deep trust in the awesome God. We have to do our best to bring our young people to a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the hurrah, hurrah kind of a situation or experience, but a deep experience where they encounter God for themselves. Our young people must not rely on the faith of their parents anymore. They must learn to experience and grow in their faith and experience God. Experience a burning bush. Encounter with God. Where they know that God is real. Where they know that God will do great miracles for their life. Deep trust. And how are we to give that experience to them? Is that we share with them what God has been dealing in our hearts. We share our heartbeat. We share our failures with them. Sometimes they look at us when we share about our failures. You know, when I was, uh, when we, we, we covenant with our family, you know, I say when all our kids graduate, our whole family will be there. And so when our youngest, you know, graduated uh, from New York, and so our whole family traveled there, you know, to celebrate with him, and, and, uh, and he couldn't travel with us because he found a job in Chicago, and so he, he started his work in Chicago, but we were there to celebrate. And on our way back, my eldest son was sitting in the plane, and suddenly he asked, he popped me the million-dollar question. He said, Pa, have you ever gone through some deep, experience of failure. I look at him, you know, and I said, well, where, where did that kind of question come from? <laughs> so it was a long journey, so I've got a long time, you know, to, to, to talk to him, you know. And so I began to share with him one particular experience. You know, he was only about six years old when we were pastoring a church. Uh, I don't know whether Chris will remember, a church, uh, a town called Port Clang, <laughs> right? Port Clang. And, uh, you know, in that, it, it was a very difficult church. You know, I, I took over from a church that was split, you know, that split from another church. And so I was trying to rebuild that church and so on and so forth. And, uh, and in, at the end of my second year, you know, the, the, the so-called leaders of the church came up to me and says, you know, Stanley, you are, you are the hindrance to the church. Wow, very daring, huh? A hindrance to the church. I say, yeah, what, in what way am I hindering? So, it is because of you that the church cannot grow. Wow, that is a very, very strong you know, uh, remark to say to me. You know, and so, and, and one by one, you know, they, they, they came up with all the various different situations, you know, where I was a hindrance to the, to the growth of the church. So I said, well, give me time to pray. Let me, let me pray and let me ask the the Lord, you know, whether He wants me to stay on or whether He wants me to leave. And so I, I, I spent some moments of prayer with my wife, you know, we fasted. You know, there was a season where we really separated ourselves, you know, to be in the presence of God. And uh, uh, the, the Lord began to reveal to us, you know, uh, that we are in a situation, we are in a toxic situation where uh, our, our presence, you know, our uh, shepherding is no longer needed there. And so, well, we, we had another meeting with them and says, very well, if you say that I am the hindrance of the church, well, I'm going to leave the church now. But you mark your words that you have said, that when I leave, the church will grow. She says, yeah. I said, okay, then you record it in the church minutes <laughs> that when Pastor Stanley leaves, the church will grow. I said, well, and fine. So we pray a prayer of blessing over them, even, even with the way we, we were treated. We pray a prayer of blessing and we say, God, we release them to the fullness of your blessing. You know, we didn't, we didn't want to do like, you know, like, like what the Old Testament says, you know, you know uh, the cursing and the blessing thing, you know. I said, no, we will just bless them. Within six months when we left and we chose to be itinerant for a period of time, because there were some that were supporting us and, say, and they came to us, hey, Pastor, you, you start a church, we come and join you. I said, no, 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 I will have no part of this, 
this thing, you know. You know, I, 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 I did my master's, you know, in a Baptist seminary and, and uh, it was a Baptist professor, you know, who, who taught First Corinthians to us and uh, he was making reference to Dr. Gordon Fee. It's a book, you know, uh, on First Corinthians, it's commentary and Dr. Gordon Fee is an, is an Assemblies of God scholar and, and, uh, and he, he wrote about church split, the schism that existed in, 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 in Corinthians and he said, Church splits out of the devil. It's demonic. And this Baptist professor who never speaks in tongue, who does not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, says, I have to agree with Dr. Gordon Fee. It is demonic. I said, wow, this fellow is, is no joke. <laughs> He's not spirit-filled, but he believes in the demonic. And when we left, we chose not to pastor a church for a period of time so that we are not accused that we are splitting churches. They were taking sheep with us. Within six months, the leaders that pointed out, you know, the number of mistakes that I have had began to fight among themselves and they began to leave the church and members began to scatter. And today, the church is only about a handful so my friends, I want to say this to you. It is important for us to understand that a deep trust in God is what we need to give our young people. So as, as I explained the situation to my eldest son, he began to, I could see tears coming down. Was, that, that I never knew that you went through that experience. I said, but that experience has matured me. It has helped me to grow. It has helped me to draw closer to God. It has helped me to understand the workings of God and to stay away from toxic situations where it can pollute my experience with God. It is a generation of passionate, active conviction that says, with God, we can. We need to challenge our young people to be united to be united to a common goal, to a common principle based on God's Word. That when we are united, we can bring down any enemy, even an enemy that is more than nine feet tall. Amen? David, amen. Praise the Lord. You know, David just couldn't tahan. Oh, man. Here's the Malaysian. <laughs> he just couldn't tahan the ridicule of this Goliath. You know, he was just, just you know, uh, uh, saying all the bad things about God. He says, you come to me with spears and, and weapons and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Wow, that was the only weapon that he had. Only weapon that he had. And yet, we all know the story. He brought Goliath town, who was more than nine feet tall. It is a generation that is committed to activism in kingdom experience. Today, our young people are very vocal. Malaysia is facing an election next week. They are very vocal. They are beginning to speak they're beginning to see things that are not right and they want to see things that are done right. They're willing to make the sacrifice. They're, they're willing to stand in the gap. They're willing to make the wrong right. And this is where they need our guidance. Folks, we need to guide them. We need to speak into their lives so that they can stand firm bold and brave for the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is also a generation of we care about God, what God thinks and what God cares about. Praise the Lord. You know, when we excite our young people, when we show them the whys we do and what we do, their hearts will be fully committed. Their hearts are fully committed. You know, during the pandemic, you know, some of you may have read 
uh, about a situation in Malaysia where, you know, there were communities that were totally you know, ran out of food. And, we, and that started the, what we call the white flag movement. You know, when they place a white flag in the house, in other words, in the, it's, it's an SOS. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough, you know, uh, uh, supplies you know, to, to, to get us going. It was our young people that responded to the challenge of the white flag movement. They banded together, they, you know, they donated, they, they volunteered their time, they volunteered their effort, they drove, you know, miles and, inter, and even interstate to help those that raised the white flag. It's no longer considering the colour of the skin, the religion, but we just help. And it was the young people that inspired the church that says we will go there. We will go there. We will give our time to serve God and to serve these people who are in great need. Number three, while we are seeing these happening, we need fathers. Hallelujah. We need fathers. Spiritual parents are needed to guide and to support the next generation. We need fathers in the church to rise up to say, I will be there. I will be there to guide you, to help you. I will be there to pass on my knowledge and the wisdom. Because we have gone through much. Is it true? We have learned from our failures. We have failed and we are willing to learn and we are willing to share. And those kind of sharings will be very, very helpful for our young people today. And I'm very sure there are many, many fathers in our midst, spiritual fathers, spiritual parents in our midst that you are willing to share your story share your story with the young people so that they can have the drive and the inspiration to take our churches to the next level. First Samuel 17, 17, G Jesse told David to deliver bread from a, hu from a, 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 a human standpoint, it was like a, a mundane task, is it true? That's a mundane task. But little did Jesse realize that it is from the natural that it turns to be a supernatural act. It is when we empower our young people, giving them menial tasks to perform. And when they have done well, when they have served well, God uses them. Amen. That God uses them. So never, never despise, you know, small tasks that have been assigned to you. You know, never say, oh, I've been created for greatness. <laughs> but always remember, greatness always have humble beginnings. Yeah, humble beginnings. My time when I started to serve God in Glad Tidings, I was given the task to just wash mats. Mats. All right, uh, my church starting in the compound of the Bible College of Malaysia. During those days, Bible College of Malaysia, we had a lot of uh, uh, greeneries, you know, grasses and tall uh, plants and trees, you know, and we would meet. Our Sunday school classes would meet under the trees and we would need mats, you know, uh, to go around the, the entire compound of the Bible College of Malaysia. And uh, the stray dogs would come in, you know, and they would... Uh, and they would uh, uh, do all their businesses on the, on the grass. And, and so when the classes are over, the mats are rolled, you know, we have all kinds of smell and all kinds of uh, 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 dirt on it. And my task every Saturday afternoon was to roll out these mats and to wash them. And to wash them. And I would do that Saturday in, Saturday out. And along with it, I will bring my little, little transistor cassette radio. <laughs> and I'll put on those Hosanna praise worship songs. And I would, uh, you know, be singing along as the songs have been played. This is the day, this is the day the Lord has made. And I'll be washing, <laughs> washing and washing and washing. And, uh, and after that, you know, I would lay out all the mats, you know, over the badminton court. And, you know, for about half an hour to 45 minutes for it to dry up. Roll it up 
and put it back in its place for use the next day. Every day for two full years without fail. Without fail. And that was my humble beginning. That was my humble beginning. Always remember, greatness starts with humility. Thank God for a powerful worship. Thank God for a powerful team that led us in worship. It's good to desire to be like them. But before you be like them, be one that just prepare the grounds, you know, fixing the wire, you know, cleaning the microphones. I'm sure during the pandemic, you would have sanitized this, you know, and sanitized that, you know, and, and so on and so forth. In Malaysia now, we have a little uh, masking, you know, uh, things over the microphone, you know. You, you know, when you pass from one speaker to another speaker, you remove the mask, you know, <laughs> you put a new one there. Do all those small, humble tasks. And when God sees your faithfulness, He'll know how to raise you up. Yeah? I always challenge young people, you know, and people at large, serve God. And I ask them, how many of you have a smile? And all of them say, uh, praise God, the entire church is enrolled in the, uh, the, the ministry of uh, ushering ministry because you can smile. <laughs> you can smile. Which is the basic prerequisite. Yeah? Welcoming. I want to share with you an experience, you know, that I had in a church. You know, if I had no church to go to, I would go to that church. I went to the church, I drove into the church, you know, and there was an usher that was waiting at the car park. And he opened my door, he welcomed me. I said, wow, this is a very special church. I've never seen usher stationed at a car park waiting for cars to come and then they open the door. Welcome, you know, to the house of the Lord. And he walked me to the next usher that was stationed that would take me into the church. And then as I entered the door of the church, the usher took me to the seat and sat me with a church member. And he introduced me to the church member. And the church member sat, you know, welcomed me and sat down and, and strike out a conversation. And I like to test, you know, uh, how well trained are the members of the church. And I, <laughs> and I said, hey, can you show me to the toilet? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. He went with me to the toilet and he stood outside the toilet. He, you know, it was not time for him to do the business. So I went in the toilet, finished and came out and, and he was there and he took me back in, sat me down. And, and when the service started, we worship, we praise the Lord. And when the service ended, he says, Brother Stanley, I didn't introduce myself as a pastor. Brother Stanley, would you like to join me for lunch? Wow, this is too much, man. You know, they treated me, a total stranger, like a VIP. And I told the pastor of the church, I'm going to take this testimony, this experience that I've had in your church, and I'm going to share it to every church that I go to. Because if I had no church to attend, that would be the church that I'll go to. Make me feel so welcome. Impossible for me not to go back. So welcome. A VIP. Fathers, you are needed in God's house. Davids need to be called. Davids need to be released. Davids need to be led by the Spirit of the Lord. And this morning, I want to believe God that God is calling the Davids in our midst to arise. And he wants to release the Davids to function the way that God wants to see them functioning. And he, the Spirit of God wants to come down upon you to anoint you so that you will be led by Him to do great exploits for the Lord. And finally, don't mess with the Davids. Don't mess with them. Because God has prepared and fashion Davids. Davids cannot be encumbered by Saul's armor and anointing. Notice that he was sent forth with what Saul used to wear. Oversized for him, right? The helmet completely covered and blocked his view. How to go and fight? His sword is so heavy. 
he would be dragging that sword on the, on the road. Impossible. Today's young people have a different method of doing things. Don't force them to do the methods that were successful for us. Today is different. It's different for them. You know, when I ask my children to show me, you know, how to use the laptop or the mobiles, you know, they'll be like, I said, slow down, lah. So fast. Like lightning, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Let me take a paper and pen. Let me show. Okay, number one, what do you do? What do you do? What do you just do? And today, my granddaughter, who is five years old and who is three years old, today, they take the smartphone completely, you know, unknown to them, you know. Their parents use a certain brand, I use a certain brand. They took my smartphone. Of course, I removed the password. Swipe, 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 swipe. See? Call me yeah, yeah. They call me yeah, yeah. Grandpa. Yeah, yeah. Like that lah. Huh? <laughs> hey, this is Samsung, you know. Your daddy is using Xiaomi. How do you do it? He says, Simply, I learn lah. <laughs> wow. Don't impose on our young people the methods that were successful for us. They will use a different method and yet experience success. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. David is waiting for an opportunity. Spiritual parents will create those opportunities and will create that path for them. Brothers and sisters, I believe that this is the word that God has for you today. And I see so many Davids in the house this morning. And I see so many spiritual parents waiting to come alongside, waiting to stand with them, waiting to guide them, waiting to forgive them, waiting also to say, take over. We will be there to help you. We will be there to push you forward. We will be there to render strength and encouragement to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, Shirabaka, Yander Bidiyan, the Labash and the Raba. Sidiyan, the Labas, Sikiriyan, the Labas, and the Labas, and that. The Spirit of God is calling out this church. He's calling out young and old. He's calling out the different generations to come together to serve Him. To be banded together like a mighty army. He's calling out the young and the old to be surrendered to Him. To be surrendered to do great exploit for His kingdom. Hallelujah. 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 The times that we're living in are times that I would call the last days. I believe with all my heart that this generation will see the return of the Lord. I believe with all my heart that this generation will be able to see and to experience the mighty visitation of the Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. At this time, I just want to ask for your response. I would like to ask for your response even right now. I'm going to call for the Davids to come. I'm going to call for the Davids to take their bold step of response to the Lord's Word. That you will say, Lord, this is the church that I belong to. This is the church that I will learn to be bended as one 
that I will learn to serve with vibrancy and fervency, that I will learn to be served with great commitment, great surrender. And God was going to use these Davids that are here today, even right now. I'm going to ask everybody just to stand to your feet even right now, just to facilitate our young people to come forward even right now. Come on. Come on, all the Davids, you are willing. You are willing to just say, Jesus, use me. Jesus, use me. Use me, Lord. Use me. I want to be bold to serve you. I want to be bold, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Just come and just stand in the presence of God and just surrender to Him, God. I want to serve you. As green as I am, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to have an experience, a burning bush experience with you, oh Lord. I want to have a burning bush experience with you this day, Father. A divine encounter. Give me a divine encounter with you, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm not just willing, Lord, to learn about Jesus from the Bible. Lord, I'm not willing to just learn about this from my youth leaders but I want to encounter you I want to experience you for myself dear Lord Lord I will cut the umbilical cord Lord even from my parents faith I want to have my own faith Lord I want to have a personal experience I want to grow the way that you want me to grow hallelujah hallelujah Come on, come on. I believe God is calling more, more Davids to arise, even this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think that this is the time that God wants us I know some of you are sitting here and you're hearing him say, oh, this next generation and your children. Actually, I think he's talking about you. Uh, you know, James and I were just having a conversation yesterday. And there needs to be something that changes here in our church. Uh, if you've been here for a while, you've seen us grow. So we've added like 150 people over the, the last couple of years, right? To say that we're short leaders is, is the most massive understatement. Uh, it, if you're thinking, oh, the young generation is me that has come in. I've been now pastoring 20 years. The young generation is not 48. Uh, there is a bunch of us and every generation, not just, and I'm so glad that we've got our high schoolers here. We've got some of the young adults that you're here, but my goodness, if you're 30 and you're 40, You've been a Christian for 20 years and you've basically not used your gifts for the kingdom of God. This is a message you need to hear. Yeah. If you're 50, if you're 60 and you haven't used your gifts to the kingdom of God, you're also the David generation. So maybe this is the time that more of us need to be up here because uh, we are facing Goliaths. We are. We're facing Goliaths. And you know what? We're in recruitment phase. We are. What is needed is for champions to arise. There yes. are, our existing team right now, our existing team right now cannot fight all the battles that are out there. Guaranteed. But as Pastor David was saying, there are Davids in here. Yes. And just be careful because you're up here and God's going to put you to work. And you'll very quickly discover that FGA is a place where at whatever age you are, if you say, God, use me, bam, Amen. you're Amen. ready to go. Yes. Because that, Hallelujah. that, it's the word in season for us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get past it. Uh, Stanley to, to pray for us. We're going we're gonna to end our service pretty soon. Uh, but Pastor Stanley, can you pray and then you're gonna, we're going to do some ministry out here and then we're going to go out 
uh, for some lunch. Yes. But it's just before he prays, now's not too late. So as he's praying, if you want to come up and be prayed for, uh, can I encourage you to get off your seat and come out here in the front. I'm going to invite Pastor Stanley to yes. pray for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this, Lord, this young David still, Lord, that are standing here. And, yes, and I thank you, dear Lord, for their responsive hearts to you, Father. Father, I just ask, oh God, that you will honor their obedience to you. Because your word says to, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so I pray, Lord, your favor to rest upon these ones, dear Lord, that have responded to you. As they lay their gifts at the altar, as they lay their lives at the altar, dear Lord. I know something supernatural is taking place in their lives. Something supernatural is happening, dear Lord. Even as Jesse releases David to deliver bread in the natural, but the supernatural had already begun. Because right after that, David took down Goliath. Hallelujah. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you will accept these gifts, these sacrifices, as they present to you, Lord their bodies, their minds, their spirit. And Lord, it is not a small thing that, that what they do today as they look back, dear God, 10 years from now, on the 13th of November, 2022, they made that commitment at the altar. 10 years after, they will be ever so thankful that they have obeyed you, dear Lord. So, Father, I ask, oh God, that you will ignite, dear Lord, their faith, ignite their spirit, cause them to rise up, dear Lord, with a spirit of boldness and courage, that they will take, dear Lord, FGA Melbourne by storm, dear Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There will be a new breed of leaders that will rise, dear Lord, Father, that this church will not just have one layer of succession planning, dear God, they will have many layers of succession in place, dear God. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, that this is a church on fire. This will be a church on fire. Hallelujah. I thank you, dear Lord. Even as I surrender and seal these brothers and sisters to you now, believing, dear Lord, Father, that you will honour their faith. You will honour their commitments to you. For I ask and I pray this now in Jesus' lovely and mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.